creation. I'll say that again, the wonder of creation. <laughs> Did you catch that quote in there? Forget Jesus, the stars died so we could be here. I heard some chuckling here at Green Bay. So this video, We Are Stardust Harvesting, Harvesting Sunlight, was done by NASA. Okay, that's a bunch of scientists, a bunch of geeked out number kind of people. But they had a phrase like that in there. And the three people that were the voiceovers, I don't know if you recognize their voices. It's Lawrence Krauss, Neil Tyson, and then Carl Sagan was the one that was probably the most um, recognizable. Now, Carl died in 1996. This was made after that. So I think they lifted a recording from him earlier. But these are three astrophysicists and they're kind of their... I looked them up, they're science commentators, whatever that is. But to me, this video and everything in it was very, very spiritual, which was kind of interesting to come out of NASA. And so what I saw it, and this actually came from Soul Matters for this month, the theme is wonder. And for the Chalice Circle packet, this is one of the spiritual exercises you can do. And I clicked on the video and was kind of blown away. So I went on my own spiritual exercise this month, and now we're all going to do it together today. So that's what all of this is about, is deepening our spirituality and pondering big things like creation, according to NASA. So how does the wonder of creation speak to you spiritually? Does it make you feel small? Does it make you feel big? Those are the questions that they kept asking, especially the second um, person who was speaking. And I couldn't really tell who was who, frankly. So we're going to do this spiritual exercise together today. And as Emmeline said, I kind of like at the last minute decided to shake this up a little bit. So it's in two parts. Part one is the wonder of feeling small, and then we'll do the musical meditation, and then we'll come back and do the wonder of feeling big. So it gives you some time to process between the two. So part one, the wonder of feeling small. So if that video didn't make you feel small enough, NASA actually published something out on Tumblr called Seven Space Facts That Will Make You Feel Small. And so I thought I had to start with that and share that with you first. So number one, our sun is one of at least 100 billion, that's with a B, billion stars just in the Milky Way. And scientists calculate that there are at least 100 billion galaxies like the Milky Way in the observable universe, each one brimming with stars. So there are more stars than grains of sand in all of Earth's beaches combined. Number two. The Milky Way is a huge city of stars, so big that even at the speed of light, which is fast, it says, it would take 100,000 years to travel across it. That's just our galaxy, the Milky Way. Number three, roughly 70% of the universe is made of dark energy, and dark matter makes up about 25%. I know nothing about either of those, but it makes up 95% of our galaxy, apparently. And the rest, everything on Earth, everything ever observed with all of our instruments, all, quote, normal matter adds up to less than 5% of the whole universe. Number four, now let's get to our galaxy. If the sun were as tall as a typical front door, Earth would be the size of a nickel. Number five, the sun accounts for almost all of the mass in our solar system, leaving 0.2%, that's 0.2% for all the planets and everything else. Think about how big the sun is then. Number six, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding and that at one point in time, 14 billion years ago, give or take, the universe was all collected in just one point of space. And number seven, four American spacecraft are headed out of our solar system to what scientists call interstellar space. Voyager 1, I remember when it took off. Voyager 1 is the furthest out, more than 11 billion miles from the sun, billion right now. It was the first man-made object to leave our solar system. Voyager 2, is speeding along at more than 39,000 miles per hour, 
but will still take more than 296,000 years to pass Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky. Okay, let's check in. So how do you feel now? When I looked at all of that, you can't help but feel small and think of that equating with feeling insignificant. The whole vastness of the universe and of time, frankly, it could lead a lot of us to just pure cynicism and nihilism. Like, what's the point? I'm just a speck of dust in all of this. And we're kind of raised to believe we're sort of the center of the universe, at least when we're children. So I just wanted to share a little bit of my story. I've shared examples before, but actually in my case, this wonder gives me a comfort in feeling small. I get a lot of comfort in, in thinking about things this way. So when I'm overwhelmed, and problems seem really great. Maybe the world's just really closing in on me with all the deadlines and the pressure. I usually go to a vast space outdoors because I can't think of a vast space indoors, but it's outdoors. It can be, sometimes it's at high cliff looking over Lake Winnebago. It could be on the shores of Lake Michigan. Um, actually one of the weirdest, strangest places, if you ever travel Highway 10 and you're going by Wyoiga, I swear, I made this up, it might be true, it might not be, but I'm entering, when you go over this little hill, you're entering the Wisconsin River Valley, and suddenly you're higher than everything, and you can just see forever, and it's just a place like that, so it doesn't have to be a mountaintop, but I find these kind of vast outdoor spaces, and I sit there and I contemplate the vastness of space, time, history, interconnectedness. I think I've shared a story with you before that I'll sit there and think, okay, I'm here in the 21st century, but before me, this was probably a trail that the first peoples used to get to somewhere, because usually we made highways out of those trails. And before that, it was probably a deer path. And before that, we were under a giant sea. And so you just think of it back in time, all of these things that have happened. And that's, to me, sort of, I think, horizontally. But I think vertically, I go up, I think about what's above the clouds in outer space and get into something like this video, but I'm grounded in the soil and can go deep and the little critters in the soil and then the soil and the bedrock and what's below that. And just all of this experience makes me feel incredibly small, but it also gives me calm because I realize I am not that important and my problems are not that important. And I actually can live out my life without obsessing about the future. The world, I promise you, this I will promise you today, it's a commitment. The world will keep rotating no matter what I decide or I do at that moment. And this gives me an intense sense of calm and I can carry on. Again, I find great comfort in the world of being small. But don't just take my word for it or my example. The Smithsonian published a study um, back in 2015, and it was titled, or the article by Danny Lewis was titled, Feeling Small in the Face of Nature Makes People More Generous. And it started out with a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary defining awe as a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. So in this case, they kind of traded the name, the word wonder and awe back and forth, but they were clear to make a distinction that awe is sort of one up from wonder because we can have awe at something because we're fearful of it, as well as something that just seems amazing, right? So the research was done at two University of California campuses in Berkeley and Irvine. And what they did is they had participants look at a lot of images, particularly from the B BBC series Planet Earth. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And then after they saw these beautiful images, they gave them questions measuring ethical behavior and generosity. Now, it turns out the participants that felt awe from what they were watching demonstrated more ethical behavior as opposed to someone who felt pride. And then they were clear to point out this wasn't just pretty images of animals. Awe is defined partly by the fear one feels in the face of something larger than themselves. So they said whether it was watching scenes from an Amazonian rainforest or a violent volcanic eruption, participants were more willing to share resources with each other afterwards. 
And then strangely, other benefits they saw from awe that they felt it may boost your immune system. And they felt it made you feel more creative. And finally, it made you feel that you have more time to get things done. And I went, aha, that's probably what I was feeling when I tapped into that. But in the end, I think feelings of comfort come from simply accepting destiny. David Eaton offers us thoughts on this in a responsive reading I'd like to use to close out this first part of my sermon. And he's going to put up some slides so the folks at home can read along, but it's number 557 if you have the hymnal and want to follow along that way. So I'll give it a minute here. All right. And Emmeline's going to come up here and help me with this. So as always, I will read the, in this case, unitalicized words, and Emmeline will lead you with the italicized part. Are you ready? All living substance, all substance of energy, being, and purpose are united and share the same destiny. All people, those we love and those we know not of, are united and share the same destiny. Birth to death, we share this unity with the sun, earth. Our brothers and sisters, strangers. Flowers of the field snowflakes, volcanoes, and moonbeams. Earth, earth, death, unknown, known, unknown. Our destiny from known to unknown. May we have the faith to accept this mystery and build upon its everything truth. And now we'll pause to think about that with some music. Thank you, Keith. I'm glad you could join us from home. It was beautiful. So part two, the wonder of feeling big. The wonder of feeling big from based on what they were saying in the video is very connected to the vast universe and, and feeling this connection. This is the path that the speakers were really trying to get us to go down, I feel. So I'm going to give you three quotes from the three speakers. The first, the amazing thing is that every atom in, our, in your body came from a star that exploded, and the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than in your right. When I look up at the night sky and I know that, yes, we are part of the universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. The second quote, I feel big because my atoms come from those stars. There's a level of connectivity. That's really what you want in life. You want to feel connected. You want to feel relevant. You want to feel like you're a participant in the goings-on of activities and events around you. That's precisely what we are, just by being alive. And finally, some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We've longed to return, and we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. 
If we think of ourselves as intricately connected with the cosmos and not apart from it, which is kind of what I was thinking when I was doing my own meditation that I shared with you, I think that's a wonder of the feeling of being big and connected. And as a part of this spiritual exercise this morning, I'd like us to ponder what we think of a recent Time article that was published this August in 2022. It's titled, Maybe the Universe Thinks, Hear Me Out, by Sabina Hossenfelder. Now, Sabina is a research fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies in Germany. Hossenfelder notes that the galaxies are clumped together in clusters and superclusters, and then they're connected by what she would call galactic filaments, which can be several hundred million light years long. And it's all due to do with gravity forces and things out in the galactic elements, right? She points out, though, that when one of, if you can pull back and use your imagination and look at the cosmic web in its entirety, it looks an awful lot like a human brain. More specifically, she says, it looks like the connectome, the network of nerve connections in the human brain. Okay, this isn't just our crazy imagination going out of control. This idea has seriously been studied, according to this Time article, by two Italians, Franco Vaza, an astrophysicist, and Alberto Felletti, a neuroscientist. Although the size of the universe, obviously, and the human connectome are radically different, they reported a remarkable similarity. Hassenfelder suggests, and I quote, could it be then that the universe is a giant brain in which our galaxy is mere one, merely one neuron? Maybe we are witnessing its self-reflection when we pursue our own thoughts, unquote. Now the article goes on to state, and it gets into a lot of detail about the speed of light is as fast as anything can travel. And then the universe would have to rely on quantum theory wormholes to be able to have energy travel across the cosmos in any amount of time that we might consider it actually a thought. But she closed the article with the point remains, it can't be unproven and therefore remains a credible hypothesis. Which leads me back to our connectedness to the universe. Now, as I researched this sermon topic, I, you know, you Google it and all kinds of things come up. I found a number of references to, and I put them in a category called being in touch with the universe in mysterious ways was my title. So there were articles about planetary cycles and how that affects things energy fields, vibrations, crystals, cosmology, coincidence, even psychic phenomena. All of these are clearly far outside of my area of expertise. And if I were to go down that path, it would probably be a whole sermon series taking us the whole spring. But nonetheless, it reminded me of a saying I use all the time. When certain things keep pointing me in a certain direction, I'll say, you know, the universe is trying to tell me something. And I thought, why do I say that? And maybe it's actually true on some deeper level that I'm not aware of. And maybe I'm just responding back. So this gets, frankly, into the mysterious part or the mystery part of spiritual exercises. Not everything that is relevant to our spiritual journey has to be right in the true sense of scientifically proven. Spiritual development is often based on metaphor and creative thought, which enables us to go deeper because it's a safe way to go deeper. That's why Grimm's fairy tales exist. In this case, how do we relate to what we now know about creation and the cosmos with all that we see? And it was captured in this beautiful video. How does the wonder of creation speak to us spiritually? How do you feel a wonder and comfort in feeling small? Or how do you feel a wonder and connectedness in feeling big? Or do you feel something entirely different? So I'm gonna end with this, let the conversation begin and let it never end for the eternity of cosmic time. Amen.